they'd be happy to put one in your hand. Just flag them down so that they see you. And please take your Bibles and let's open them up to Paul's letter to Titus for one last time. As of today, there will be 24 messages on this um, letter that we've walked through. I think we've been in it for about six months or so, a little longer than that. And what we're going to do today is not look at any one particular verse. We've done that with every single verse. But we're going to look at the great theme that is in this short little letter. And without surprise, the theme is God. And in particular, that God is the Savior. And even more specifically for us, He is our Savior. And everyone loves a good story of a rescue, a deliverance, a heroic saving act. Everybody loves that. The best books, in my opinion, develop such plots. And the box office has no trouble selling movies with that theme, do they? But there is the obvious prerequisite for the rescue that is needed. And it is the anxiety-producing descent into tragedy or the free fall into danger, hopelessness, and despair. You can't have a rescue without that. A rescue makes no sense without that. Think about it from another angle. When you're planning for something joyous, like the birth of your child or engagement day or graduation celebrations, baby's first birthday, your wedding day, when you're planning for something joyous like vacation, you never plan those with a rescue in mind. Why? Because a rescue only makes sense where there is a tragedy, a serious danger, and you don't want tragedy and your joyous occasion to intersect. And so when you plan your celebration, you don't think that way. You want those things to be mutually exclusive. A rescue, a deliverance, only makes sense when the prerequisite has been met. And then the deliverance, a heroic saving act that they make total sense. And so this you know. Whenever you see a rescue taking place, whenever you see a deliverance or a saving act in the world, you know that a tragedy has occurred or is threatening. Now watch this in Titus. Chapter 1, verse 3. In the middle of the verse, Paul says, In the proclamation which, which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Next verse. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Chapter 2, verse 10. So that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. Verse 13 the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 4, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Verse 6, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Back in chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation. Chapter 3, verse 5, he saved us. In Titus, you can't help but read of a Savior who is saving. It is God. God our Savior, as Paul says. And we know wherever you see a Savior saving, what? Tragedy. Danger. Hopelessness, despair are nearby. 
Well, does Titus describe that? Does Titus describe this tragedy that meets the prerequisite for God, our Savior, saving man? Listen to these descriptions of the tragedy and the danger that sin creates within the human heart. Chapter 1, verse 10. Men become rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. Next verse. We are capable of upsetting whole families. We are capable of being driven by sordid game. Verse 12, whole groups of humanity are described as always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's tragic. Verse 14 of chapter 1, men turn away from the truth. That's dangerous. Verse 15, we are defiled and unbelieving. In fact, both our mind and conscience defiled. Verse 16, man denies God being detestable, disobedient, and worthless for any good Indeed, what hopelessness, what despair there is. Chapter 3, verse 3, man is foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Man spends his life in malice and envy. And man is hateful, hating one another. In chapter 3, verse 10, sin makes men become factious, divisive, perverted, self-condemned. That's quite a detailed description of the truly tragic and ruined condition that sin has created in the human heart. That's a dangerous spot to be in with God. And how hopeless it is for man if man looks to himself to remedy the problem. And how hopeless it is for man to look to one another as if one man could look to another and say, save me from this. How do people who are envious of one another, who are malicious towards one another, who deceive one another and are deceived by each other, who are hateful towards each other, hating one another, how do they help each other out of this? A rescue for humanity will not come from fallen humanity. We desperately need a rescue, a, a deliverance. We need a Savior who saves Titus makes it clear that the prerequisite for a rescue has more than sufficiently been met. We need a Savior. You, you need a Savior. And that is what Titus reveals God to be. So let's examine this great God who is our Savior. But let's pray first. Will you pray with me? Oh, Father in heaven, you are revealed in this letter to be a Savior, the only Savior. Would you please this morning, Father, for those who are in desperate need of your saving, would you open their eyes, open our eyes yet once again, that we might see you in all of your glory as a Savior, in all of your kindness and your mercy and your love, your grace. Help us to see you for who you are, for what you are, a Savior, the only Savior. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I have a simple outline for you this morning, just two points. The first one is our Savior's nature, and you'll see in a moment. The second one is our Savior's work. But let's talk first about what Titus reveals about our Savior's nature. Titus presents God our Savior as a triune being. 
meaning one God in three persons. Sometimes he's referred to as the Godhead, three beings, three persons in one being. The Trinity is bound up in perfect oneness, but in such a way that allows the distinct roles of each member to be carried out for our salvation without diminishing that oneness that God has. So the focus in Titus is on this, that all three members are united as one in the salvation of sinners. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. There's God, the Father. The Savior God that we have is a Father. In verse 4. And we find out actually indirectly in verse 7 that he has a household because he has stewards in his household. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. The elder, the overseer, is a household manager. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 talks about the church being the household of God. So God... The Father has a household. We are the household. That's who our Savior God is. He's a Father. And the Savior God is also Messiah or Christ, Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Chapter 2, verse 13, we're looking for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 6, Jesus Christ is our Savior. And this Savior God is also the Spirit of holiness, the the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, dot, 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 by the washing of of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The way that we are saved is by this washing effect that the Holy Spirit provides for us. And all three are united in their Savior oneness. God the Father is our Savior with kindness and love for us. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior who gave himself in death to redeem us and to purify us. Chapter 2, verse 14. And chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, our Savior Father poured out through the Savior Son the Holy Spirit so that he could assuredly wash us to save us. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he, the Father, poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. All three persons in one are an inseparable, saving Savior. Our sin caused an incalculable tragedy in our lives, damage in our lives, a massive offense. We've provoked a devastating judgment against us by our nature, by our doing. We've created for ourselves, because of our sin, an incalculable hopelessness and despair for us. And God, in response to that, is a three-in-one united Savior bringing salvation. Three eternal persons, three eternal persons in one being, all united to rescue us from our massive sin tragedy. There is no other Savior than this one. All three members of the Godhead are united in the salvation of sinners. That's our Savior's triune nature. Number two, let's talk about our Savior's work. And let's try to follow Paul's thought in Titus to help us 
reconstruct our Savior's great work in salvation. This short little three-chapter letter spells it all out. Let's start with chapter 1, verse 2. I'll start at verse 1. Paul's a bondservant of God, and he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, he's an apostle in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Long ages ago, we're talking about God's salvation work. Long ages ago, God promised eternal life. The promise was made before time existed. So the triune God was the only one around when the promise was made. The three members made the promise to one another. That the very life they enjoyed together, an eternal life, would be given to man who one day would find hope in it. Long ages ago, God promised eternal life. Look at verse 1. Paul is an apostle for the faith of those chosen of God. Those who in time have the hope of eternal life are the very ones that God chose before time for faith in Him. And again, this choice was made without any of us there. Only God was there in His triune greatness when the choice was made. Before the foundation of the world, He chose us in Him. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. God's grace then in time in human history appeared in the most climactic way possible. In the first coming of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Through that first appearance of Jesus, through his life that he lived and through his death that he died and through his resurrection from the dead, God's grace appeared in human history unlike it had ever appeared before. God's grace was there in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. God's grace was there at the flood preserving Noah. God's grace was there with Abraham. And God's grace has always been there, but it reached a climax in the coming of Jesus Christ. And his grace in Christ's first appearance was intent on this, on saving men and women and boys and girls from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. And it was not a sectarian grace that could be confined to any one tribe or any one group or any one people or any one nation. No, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And then chapter 2, verse 14, tells us just exactly how God our Savior did the saving work. He did it by His Son, giving Himself in death at the cross in order to redeem sinners who were under the tragic penalty of sin and wrath. No other sacrificial death by a substitute would ever be needed again. Because 2,000 years ago, in the death of the sinless Son of God, salvation was purchased by Jesus for all whom God would save. Chapter 2, verse 14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. And we haven't even been born yet, covering up to the cross. That's historical salvation. That happened 2,000 years ago and a long time before. How, how does historical salvation become personal salvation? That's what chapter 3 is about, verse 4. Then God's kindness and love appeared to one soul after another soul after another soul, after another soul. 
That's when the saving death of the son 2,000 years ago gets applied specifically and personally to the one God our Savior is saving. Verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. And verse 5 tells us that God's standard for saving those who were in great danger, his standard is his mercy or his pity for us. His standard or his basis for saving us is not us trying to sham up some, some kind of form of righteousness that will impress him. What moved God to save us was his own mercy. It was n- not anything deserving in us. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but he saved us according to his mercy. Our Heavenly Father, our Savior, abundantly poured out in our conversion his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that his Spirit could wash us and wash us with a a washing that this world could never come up with or that you could ever come up with. Because this is the washing of regeneration. This is the washing of renewing. It's being born again from above. God our Father had grace on us. He had mercy on us. He had kindness towards us. He had love toward us. And the Son gave himself in death at the cross for us. And the Spirit was abundantly poured out on us personally so that his washing work could save us. Personal salvation comes no other way. What a Savior that he would be united in this way to save you, to save me. Who's the you and the me? Verse 7 of chapter 3, the ones who have been justified by his grace. God justifies sinners on the basis of grace, meaning he justifies on the basis of faith alone. He does not justify or declare one righteous on the basis of works at all. Verse 5, he saved us not on the basis of good deeds which we have done in righteousness. Men do this all the time. They come up with some kind of a righteousness that they think is impressive, and they do the deeds of that righteousness, and they hope to present it to God and have God say, you're okay. And he saves us Not on that basis. But he justifies us, declares us righteous by grace, which means by faith alone. That is a grace oriented salvation, not a works oriented salvation. Personal salvation happens when God does all of that in his triune goodness. And there's more that he does. Chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And then that grace is instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That saving grace of God stands at the door of salvation. We've talked about this. The saving grace of God stands at the door of salvation when you are on the outside without Christ, without hope, in despair, with no salvation. Saving grace stands there and says, no good works from you to get in. And grace picks us up and carries us across the threshold of salvation. And then grace upon saving us On the basis of faith alone, grace puts us down on a path to walk and live on. And when we get put down by grace on that path, we have new feet, and we've got new legs, and we've got a new equipping, and we're full of new desire to deny ungodliness. To deny worldly desires with desire to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. 
Grace is instructing us on that path toward good deeds. That's the path beyond the door of salvation. That's the path of progressive sanctification. And this is important for us to understand as a fruit of salvation. Why did Jesus redeem you? Look back at chapter 2, verse 14. Believer, he redeemed you from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who would be zealous for good deeds. That's why he died. That's why he purifies you, is for good deeds. Not only do you need to know what you've been saved from, every lawless deed, but you need to, be, you need to know what you've been saved to, good works. You're not saved by good works. You are saved from your lawless works to do good works. And in so doing those kinds of good deeds, we prove ourselves to be fruitful. Chapter 3, verse 14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. And that is God's salvation work up to the present. Takes you right to today. If you're a believer, this is God's saving work in your life. And yet there's still even more. Chapter 2, verse 13. This grace that is in us is working in us in such a way that we are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. God, our Savior's salvation has not yet been fully experienced by those who have believed him here. Jesus is coming in glory, and the saving and sanctifying grace of God within us, it gives us an eye to look for him. Smith talked about this when we were getting, preparing to take communion. You want him to come. Everything that's going on in this world needs to get spoiled by him and his coming. We want him to come for us. We're longing for his coming when we will then step into the next expression of salvation life, the eternal life with Jesus. So this is our triune Savior. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, each labor in their unique roles to save us, and yet they act in perfect oneness as Savior. There is no other Savior than this one. Sinners who, because of their sin, are in a tragic and dangerous and hopeless, dreadful consequence of sin and before a holy God have no other place to look than to him. This triune God who saves will not be impressed by any other approach to salvation than the one that is in him and in him alone. And so there's only one question to ask after that, and it's this. What's your response? What's your response to this? God, with this kind of a savior nature, with this kind of salvation work. First, first, you must agree with God. You must agree with God about some important things. First, you must agree with God about the danger that you are in, that he says you are in because of your sin against him. See, the Bible makes clear that his wrath poses an eternal danger toward you. And you must agree with his assessment of you that you are in a condition in which you need a savior. Listen, you, you don't go to the doctor until you're convinced that he is the only one who can help you. And not only must you agree with him about that, but you must agree with him that he alone is your only hope for salvation, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. You must agree with him on that, and that there is no other way. His saving triune nature and his saving work is your only hope for deliverance from your, from your sin and from his wrath. You must agree with him on that. 
Do you agree with chapter 3, verse 3, that you are foolish, disobedient, deceived without him, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures on your own, that you spend your life in malice and envy without him, that you are a hateful one without him, even hating one another? Secondly, you must express that agreement with God through faith alone. How do you express that agreement with God? God, I agree with you that I am in that kind of terrible condition, and I agree with you that you are my only hope. You express that agreement with faith. You entrust your soul to him and to him alone to save you. That's at the doorway of salvation. You, there you, you are in such a stained and deplorable, hopeless condition that you could never, ever on your own generate even one good deed that would catch his eye and move him to reward you with salvation. In the condition that you were in without Christ, it's what we all were without Christ. We were, as verse 16 of chapter 1 says, detestable and disobedient, and we were worthless for any good deed. If that is God's assessment of us, that we are worthless for any good deed, why would he say, try to do some good deeds when he knows they're worthless? And the point is, is he's not asking you to do good deeds. He's saying, agree with me that you are worthless for any good deed. And in agreeing with him, you entrust your life to him and to him alone. Doing good deeds to be saved is simply not an option in the Savior's mind. Only his grace will save you, meaning only by grace alone, through faith alone, can you be saved. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but he saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Faith alone will save you, nothing else. If you haven't yet believed Christ, will you today? It's your only hope. Kids, listen. I know you're growing up in Christian homes with Christian dads and Christian moms. You must believe. You must believe. You must agree with God, what he says about your condition and what your only hope is. Lastly, something I want to focus on, look back at chapter 1, verse 16. Some people profess to know this God, and yet something is really, really wrong with them. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. You will assure your heart. You will assure your mind that your faith in the Savior is real and that it is genuine by being zealous for good deeds now. That is how you comfort your heart and comfort your mind. That is where your confidence comes that he indeed has saved you is by the fact that you have become zealous for good deeds. You see, a lifestyle, a style of living that is marked by sinful deeds all of the time is not what Jesus died to redeem you to from and to and purify you to. A changed life, a lifestyle zealous for good deeds is what Jesus died to redeem and purify us for. And when we live that lifestyle out, being zealous for good deeds, as believers, we provide evidence for our soul, evidence for our minds that our lifestyle, our style of living actually matches what God said he did when he saved us. Maybe to help 
flesh this out a little bit more, I want you to consider the following examples. There's a kind of man who thinks that his good deeds will earn him salvation from God. Some of you used to think that way, I know. Maybe you even think that this morning. How does that claim to salvation align itself with what God says salvation is? It doesn't align. And so therefore, that one who makes that claim to salvation has no assurance, no confidence that he or she is saved. Because it does not align with what God says God does to save sinners. It doesn't matter how sincere the person might be. Sincerity does not save. God saves. And when he sa saves, we are in agreement with him about what he says about us and about our inability to do good works, and we abandon the idea of doing good works to be saved. To make the claim to salvation that thinking your good deeds will earn salvation from God provides you no assurance of salvation. None. Consider this person. There's another man who believes that he is saved by his faith alone and he does not engage in good deeds. How, to, how does that claim to salvation and that commitment to sanctification align with how God says he saves and sanctifies sinners? Well, the first part sounds good. He sounds aligned Saved by grace alone, but I don't need to do any good deeds. That part does not align at all. And therefore, if he's not aligned with God in both, his assurance of salvation is evaporating or non-existent. Because it does not align with what God says. What about this person? The one who believes that he is saved by grace alone through faith alone and daily striving by God's grace to do good deeds. How does that claim to salvation and that commitment to sanctification align with what God says he does when he saves a sinner? It does. And so the closer aligned you are with your claim to salvation, with what God says he does when he saves a sinner, and the closer you are aligned with your commitment to sanctification of what God says he does when he sanctifies a sinner, a believer who is saved, the closer they align, the greater the assurance, the greater the confidence, the greater the peace in your heart that what you possess in salvation is truly what God says he does. The closer your claim to faith, the closer your commitment to good deeds aligns with what God our Savior does when he saves a sinner. The greater confidence, the greater assurance you have that he indeed has saved you. So believers, press on. Persevere. Don't give up. Keep pressing Persevere in your claim to salvation. Keep preaching the gospel to yourself that you believe that God saved you not on the basis of deeds which you did in righteousness. He saved you on the, according to his mercy. He saved you simply by washing you. He saved you by justifying you by, by his grace through faith alone. Keep preaching that claim to salvation to yourself over and over and over. Persevere in that. Don't give up in that. And persevere in your commitment to sanctification. That he says that he saved you to purify you to become someone who would be zealous for good deeds. That the grace of God is instructing you to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, godly in this present age. Keep preaching that fruit of the gospel to your life. That's what the gospel is supposed to produce in you. You persevere in both of those things, that I'm saved by grace alone, I'm saved by grace alone, I'm saved by grace alone, and I want to do good deeds by your grace in my life, on the path of sanctification, 
persevere. That perseverance in practicing obedience is never perfect, is it? It's never perfect. You have not had one day of perfect sanctification. In fact, oftentimes that path of sanctification is wet with tears, isn't it? From your broken heart and your sorrow over your sin that you wish to be free of but just aren't yet. And that path of sanctification is marked by a sorrow that leads you to repentance where you want to come back again to the truth you know to be true in the word of God about how he saves and how he sanctifies. And a renewed resolve in Christ is generated in that repentance to walk in greater holiness of life. So believers persevere in trusting Jesus alone and persevere in practicing obedience to him and your heart will be most happy in Christ then. Let's pray. As we pray, I know that sometimes we can reach a point where we feel that our faith will fail. There's times that we fear our faith is failing and, or that it will fail. I want you to listen to the words of, the, of this hymn and I want you to find hope in it as you put your eyes on Christ. If that's you this morning, put your eyes on Christ. And listen to these words. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. For my life, he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. Oh, Father... Lord Jesus, hold on. We know you are. Make us more aware of your tightened grip upon us. Strengthen us to hold on to you by faith. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.